Welcome to the Jerry Powell Pack. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Wait, I have a question. Is Say a guest or is he a co host? Co host. Today. Co host? Are you, a, are you a, guest? a guest? What are you? He's a guest. He's a guest. I'm, a guest. I'm happy. He's an author, so he has to be a guest. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to be whatever uh, whatever role that you guys want me to play. Yeah, you have to introduce Say then, too. Okay, I'll introduce Say. Okay. Yeah. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Widera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, what are we talking about today and who do we have on? Today we're talking about wealth-associated disparities in death and disability in the United States and England. And we have two guests today. We have Lena Macaroon, who is a health service health research fellow at the VA Puget Sound up in Seattle. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Lena. Welcome. Thanks, Alex and Eric. Happy to be here. And we have Say Lee, who has joined us as a co-host on previous episodes of the Jerry Pal Podcast, but is an author on the paper that we're going to be discussing today. Say is Associate Professor of Medicine here at UCSF in the Division of Geriatrics. Welcome back to the Jerry Pal Podcast, Say. Great to be here. And Lena, we ask all our guests for a <laughs> song. Do you have a song for Alex to sing? I would love to hear Alex sing Mercedes Benz by Janis Joplin. Very appropriate for the topic. And Say's going to join. Exactly. So we'll get started on a um, song of great social and political import. Oh, Lord, won't, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. Worked hard all my lifetime. No help from my friends. So Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Lena, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? You know, get back to me in maybe 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of uh, Mercedes Benzes and wealth in general. Uh, if we only bought the people at the lowest end of the socioeconomic spectrum, <laughs> Mercedes Benzes. Well, maybe that's the issue. There is uh, Mercedes Benzopenia. Um, what is the plural of Mercedes Benz? Mercedes Benzes. Benzies? Benzos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, sorry, you were saying. <laughs> yeah, so you just had a paper published recently in uh, JAMA IM uh, talking about what was the title? Uh, Wealth Associated Disparities and Death and Disability in the United States and England. Can you maybe take a step back and both you and Say talk a little bit about why, why did you pick this as a topic of research? So I did my geriatrics fellowship not too long ago um, over at UCSF. And one of the things I kind of started to notice while I was seeing patients in the outpatient clinic was that it didn't really seem to be the pills I was prescribing or the tests I was ordering that was having the biggest impact on their health and quality of life in many instances. It seemed to be a lot of the social circumstances that they found themselves in. And a lot of times often, you know, uh, their financial resources that enabled people to adapt to different changes that come with aging. And so I kind of started to wonder a little bit about how wealth enabled people to age well. Um, and that kind of spurred um, a lot of uh, the foundation of this retro study. And I think Say was also interested in uh, understanding how wealth might impact people's uh, health and longevity. And so that mm. was kind of the birth of this project. Is that what you're thinking, Say? Uh, pretty much. I mean, I feel like uh, this all happened uh, with a conversation between Lena, me, uh, and a couple of other faculty members where we talked about, you know, it seems like sometimes the best thing that we can do for older adults is actually to provide them resources so that they can actually uh, change their house as their abilities change or so that they can actually get more help. Um, and it very quickly kind of went from there, huh, resources, how can we measure resources? What's our other interesting uh, perspectives on this issue uh, that we could look into? So there seems to be some, there's a clinical justification for this, and let's talk more about what you did in terms of a research perspective. So what, what did you do? So we used 
pre-existing uh, longitudinal data sources and did kind of looked at the information that was already being collected um, and did a secondary data analysis. So specifically, we um, use the health and retirement study, which is a longitudinal cohort study in the United States. And then the nice thing is that a lot of different countries after the United States started the health and retirement study um, kind of modeled similar longitudinal studies in their own countries to look at um, a, a number of different health and socioeconomic variables in their own aging populations. And so England um, developed the English longitudinal co uh, study on aging, which we also looked at because we wanted to kind of compare how uh, the relationship between wealth and aging might uh, differ in two different countries that have really very different social and uh, healthcare safety net systems. So we went ahead and uh, looked at wealth, uh, which was measured in those two studies uh, by self-report on a number of different uh, variables. So for example, um, a lot of times when studies have been done looking at the association of socioeconomic status with different health outcomes, they look at income. But we know that a lot of older adults um, may no longer have steady income. A lot of times they're retired. And so we were thinking, you know, income is probably not a robust enough measure of someone's financial capacity in retirement. And so what we did is we looked at um, a host of uh, financial asset variables and subtracted debt and came up, that was our wealth variable. And yeah. we looked at how that was related to death and disability in uh, both of those countries. And what, and just because I think this may come up later yeah. in our discussion, what age range did you look at? Yeah, so um, we looked at two different age groups. So uh, a below and above age 65. So we looked at 54 to 64 year olds, and then we looked at 66 to 76 year olds. And the reason we did that is because um, 65 is the age, as you know, in the United States where Medicare becomes available, but also in both countries, England and the US, it's around the age where the major retirement benefit comes becomes available. So in the US, that's Social Security. And in England, that's something called the state pension. Um, and so we also we, we made those two age categories because we wanted to see was there a difference in the relationship before and after age 65 when you have implementation of those safety net programs. And an important also to note, um, in England, they have the National Health Service, which provides free medical care, right, for everybody across the age spectrum. Is that right? Exactly. So from birth, um, universal access to um, health care, exactly through the NHS. Say so any other key points about the methods? We need to leave a lot of time for the results because there are so many interesting wrinkles to this study. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that I would say is that, uh, as uh, I think probably most of our listeners will know, um, this is an area looking at socioeconomic status and outcomes where there's been a lot of studies before. But I think this study definitely does add some new things. And specifically, focusing on wealth, I think, is something that hasn't been done very often. And as also looking at disability, which older adults find as, you know, oftentimes as important as mortality, I think think those are the two main new things and that superimposed on this kind of looking at transnational comparisons made this really an interesting study to to do and also kind of brought out some interesting points in the results. All right, so what did you find? Well, um, not to get too into the weeds, but broadly what we found is that um, in both the United States and in England and in both of the age categories, so both above and below age uh, 65, uh, low wealth was associated with increased hazard of death and disability um, across the wealth spectrum. So let's unpack this a little yeah. bit because there yeah. are a lot of different parts of this. First, let's just say, like, how big are the differences in wealth in the U.S., wealth inequality? How big of magnitude are we talking about these right. differences in wealth inequality? Right, right. So um, when you looked at, so what we did is we split up wealth into quintiles. And so it might be easiest to talk that's about it that way. Quintiles, that's five. Exactly. So five different um, categories of wealth based on uh, the proportion of people that, you know, fit into each one. So 20% of people fitting into each one. And what we found, so for example, for the lowest age group in um, the United States, 
the poorest group had an average wealth of about $6,500. And when you compare that to the richest group, the richest group had an average wealth of about $1.5 million. Mm. So really a huge range there. Um, and we saw similar ranges, you know, when you looked at the older age group in the US, it was about $8,000 for the, the poorest. So you do see, you know, as you get older, you are able to accumulate a bit more wealth. Um, but again, compared to the richest, um, who had about 1.4 million, really, really big difference. And we saw similar differences um, in England. I'll just give one example, you know, and these are in pounds, uh, which is the English currency. So the older age group uh, in England, the poorest had about 5,000 pounds of wealth and the richest had about uh, close to 600,000 pounds of wealth. And remind me again, wealth is defined as all it's, of your your home and home minus debt or how? how right. It? Well, it's cumulative assets minus debt. And so what cumulate, like just to give you an example. So assets included things like the, the value of property, vehicles, savings accounts, stocks, bonds, retirement accounts, things like that. And how good are people are accurately defining their wealth? <laughs> That's a good question. I actually don't know the answer. I have to presume there probably is some measurement error there because it is a self-reported thing. However, I would assume that whatever error is going in would be similar in in both groups. But yeah, I don't I don't actually know. Uh, I think the one thing the one thing that I would say is this is actually a critical component of both the uh, health and retirement study and the English longitudinal study on aging. Uh-huh. So they ask a lot of questions about this and try to drill down to the level of if people are uncomfortable, for example, giving their um, uh, giving a specific number for one of these values. They ask bracketing questions of, oh, is your health worth more than this amount? Is mm-hmm. it worth less? Than this amount so Mm -hmm. that we try to get as much information as possible. Um, But as you can imagine, this is a sensitive question. And so there may be um, uh, inaccuracies introduced by reporting. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think what Lena was talking about was that uh, it's uh, it's unlikely that the inaccuracies are systematic and all in one direction so that we'll get uh, grossly biased results. So wealthy people live longer? Yes. What do I do with like is that that seems like it has good face validity, but right. I'm not 100 percent sure like what we should do with that. So, you know, I I don't know that there's something that doctors on an individual basis are going to do with that information. To me, the biggest implications of these types of findings are for policymakers and people kind of at health system or kind of leadership positions that are thinking about, you know, how for this population of people, how do I reduce disparities in longevity and disability? And in thinking about that, I think what this paper really showed is that you can't just think about, um, access to health care. So for example, we didn't really see a major attenuation in this relationship um, in England where they have universal health care from birth or in the U.S. after age 65, once Medicare comes into effect, we really didn't see a major um, attenuation of this effect. So thinking about how do we then narrow this gap? I think we have to think outside of healthcare to fiscal and social policies and probably target those interventions much earlier in the lifespan. So probably by the time you're, you know, in your 50s and 60s, you've already experienced the cumulative stressors over your life that result from low wealth. And it may be that the impacts that those have on your health and your function are, are it's too late to kind of change those later in your life. And so to me, those are two of the big takeaways. And really, I think those are for people in positions of leadership, but also for us individually um, to advocate for those types of things. I think as healthcare providers and um, physicians in particular, you know, we are trained in the biomedical model of how to intervene and, you know, 
improve health, but health we know is the result of so many th- more things than just um, you know therapeutics. And so I think advocating for policies that address some of these um, wealth-related disparities is something that we can all do. I have to say I was somewhat disappointed to, to read that at age 65 there was in the U.S. there was no change and that these same disparities in disability and mortality by wealth were present in the U.K. where they have a national health service as there were in the U.S. I was hoping that this would be an argument yeah. for universal health care I know that's <laughs> across the age spectrum. But unfortunately, this is not that article. Say you look like you're going to say something. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, that was certainly one of our hypotheses going in. Uh, and I think what uh, the lesson that I take away from this is, as a doctor, I think too highly of what doctors do. <laughs> uh, and we think that hospitals and being able to see doctors are going to be so important. And I think on an individual case-by-case situation, that may absolutely be true here and there. But on a population level, um, exactly as Lena said, um, what we see is that the differences that we see across wealth is actually uh, doesn't really change very much just because you uh, somebody gets to the age of 65 and now they have Medicare, for example, in the United States and are able to see the doctors. The transition, the relationships between wealth and disability and death in the UK where they have um, uh, insurance at the, the National Health Service throughout the age spectrum is identical to the US where, you, where uh, a, some um, folks don't have health insurance until age 65 and then they get it. Yeah, and I... Alex, I shared your kind of head in hands moment when, you know, we saw these results and I kind of crossed my fingers and thought, oh, God, I hope that this is not interpreted as an argument against universal health care, which I'm a huge proponent of. I think, you know, what I would say is that, number one, we didn't look at there, there's a number of other benefits that have been shown uh resulting from universal health care, you know, reduced medical debt, improved uh, improvement in having a usual source of care, improvement in access to care. You know, there's a number of benefits that we didn't look at. You know, we were looking at two, you know, very specific outcomes. Um, but the other thing is, I think what I would say is that uh, rather than saying universal health care doesn't help, I would just say it's not enough. You know, it's important uh, and I would say, you know, if, for a lot of other outcomes is very, very important. But probably when um, we're looking to move the needle on really big outcomes like, you know, mortality and disability, especially in older age categories, we we, we need more. Um, and the other thing I just want to highlight is that we didn't actually do statistical comparisons um, looking at you know, comparing the U.S. and England or comparing above and below age 65. Um, it was more of a qualitative comparison looking at the at the graphs of the trends. So um, I wanted to kind of um, put a couple of things that I think are like takeaways that I've uh, that I'm uh, taking away from uh, this article. So number one is that it's not that great to be rich but it really sucks to be poor. Hmm. Uh, and so if you look at how the pers- the people at the top quintile do versus the people at the, the second the top quintile do, um, in terms of both death, mortality, and disability, there's really not that much difference whether you're in the top quintile or second the top quintile. Uh, however, on the other side of the spectrum, it really sucks to be on at to be at the bottom rung in terms mm. of wealth of, of the wealth spectrum um, for in both HRS and in both the U.S. and in England, being at the bottom quintile really puts you at much higher risk for death and much higher risk for d- disability. So it really sucks to be mm-hmm. at the bottom of the socioeconomic scale right. in and, both countries. And we have going through Congress and committee right now a tax bill that largely favors the wealthy. And uh, favors the the poorest group the least. Um, so this has important implications for um, for public policy beyond yeah. health policy and the implications of things like taxation and income inequality. 
Yeah, I think uh, other studies have uh, previously shown this as well, but we did quantify kind of the level of income disparity in the U.S. versus the U.K., and we did find that there was more income inequality uh, in the U.S. And wealth. So yeah, wealth so, and income yeah, inequality were both greater in the U.S. than in England. And also what was interesting was to see that there is actually greater wealth disparity compared to income in both countries. So, you know, I think of wealth as kind of a marker of your lifelong kind of what you've been able to accumulate. Um, and so when you look at that, it kind of takes into account someone's circumstances throughout their life. And it turns out that there's more disparity in wealth um, later in life uh, than there is in income even. And, you know, regarding the tax bill, I would say I think it's it's very concerning. And I think that, you know, one of the things that's heartening about what our paper showed was that, as say mentioned, it's really bad to be the poorest. You know, when you we look at that lowest wealth quintile, they're they're really not doing so well. But the biggest improvements in health outcomes that we see, saw were going from the lowest wealth quintile to the second lowest wealth quintile. So relatively small gains in wealth um, at that low end of the spectrum actually resulted in the biggest improvements in outcomes. And so I think when so we try to you don't need to, to trans- buy them a Mercedes Benz. Exactly. You exactly. buy them a Honda. A used <laughs> Honda. <laughs> Just trade in their bus pass for a used Honda. Exactly. Um, you know, but I think that's heartening. And I think that that uh, has a lot of relevant policy, trans- you, you know, translation in that It doesn't have to be that much, but basic, you know, and there's really some interesting stuff going on. Um, There's a mayor in, oh God, now I can't remember, where they're piloting universal income for the entire city. But, you know, thinking about novel things Mm -hmm. outside the box like that and understanding Mm -hmm. that kind of at a basic level, people need a certain amount to avoid Mm -hmm. kind of chronic housing instability, chronic stress, susceptibility Mm -hmm. to drug and alcohol abuse, all these things that down the line are really going to impact health. Yeah, it's fascinating. Think about all these countries or places where they have programs that uh, that boost everyone just by the numbers, it boosts the lowest the most, um, right? So, you know, $25 is not that much to somebody who has a wealth of $1.5 million, but to somebody who has a, you know, an- wealth of 8000 it probably means something. A lot. Right. Yeah. Uh, I-, I think the other point, the other kind of uh, uh, finding that I want to make sure doesn't get lost is, how common uh, disability was uh, in both even the younger groups uh, in the U.S. and uh, England, we found, you know, 40 to 50 percent of those in the lowest wealth court, uh, quintile in the 50s to 60s, uh, 54 to 64 age group. 40 to 50 percent had difficulty with ADLs. Usually we think about activities of daily living difficulties as something in, that happens to people in their 70s, uh, something that happens to people in their 80s. And so this is definitely earlier than we would expect, and it shows how um, the stress of having low wealth, low socioeconomic status is making some of these uh, um, um, really middle-aged adults uh, look a lot more like older adults. Interesting. So how did, does any idea how this played across the pond um, in England? What was the reaction to this article? Um, well, I, I haven't been, uh, I guess, on my social media British connections or anything, but there was an editorial that was written um, about the article um, by a British author. And they seem to, I mean, I think there's some surprise, but also recognition at the same time uh, that this is still a problem in England. And I think that on the ground there, they recognize that. But I don't know, say, have you had any other feedback from English colleagues or friends? I, I have not, and I think that yeah. is, um, you know, I think on a uh, the I, I was struck by the editorial, uh, really talking about how one of the I guess there's no other way to put it. One of the political problems of uh, focusing on the lowest wealth 
groups is that it's very politically easy for that to get demonized as kind of class warfare. We're helping the other, whereas successful uh, programs actually are much more universal in their nature. And so, Mm -hmm. as uh, Alex mentioned previously, if we give $25 to everybody, uh, if we give a certain amount to everybody, it will have the natural effect of having the greatest impact for those at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, because relatively it will be mean so much more to them, and politically, it is much more. Um, it is uh, a much more um, stable and uh, oftentimes durable solution. And so that's, I think, uh, so, you know, this is, this finding is, this is certainly not the first time that this finding has, uh, has come about. And, and so there is definitely a segment of uh, uh, the readership that has been uh, already thinking about how to implement uh, how do we implement this? And and as uh, you alluded to before, this is not necessarily at about kind of what does can an individual doctor do, but how can we take a second look at the systems we have in place to try to uh, uh, try to avoid some of these systemic uh, inequalities? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even though this is a relative, you know, it's a difficult time in many ways. I think for. Um, health policy in the United States. Uh, it's also a really ripe time, I think, for doctors and other healthcare professionals at, or and public health professionals who care about these issues to have their voices heard and kind of um, speak up about evidence-based policies that might help reduce some of these disparities. So is there a next step for both of you as far as this research line of thought? Um, so one thing that... Uh, is like like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, there's a lot a number of different countries that have similar kind of sister data sets. And so it might be interesting to see, um, you know, are these findings replicated in other countries that even have different types of systems? Um, so that's one potential next step uh, in terms of seeing, you know, where this type of relationship does and doesn't exist. I mean, I guess the um, really interesting next step and would be testing potential interventions. And so, you know, in some of these smaller local places where they're trying different types of income based or financial policy based interventions to help people, the problem is always that the outcomes that you're going to see are really far down the line. And, you know, it's uh, delaying gratification like that is always really hard, especially in science, scientific fields where we want to see uh, the impact of our interventions. Maybe to sum up, well, well, like what's the like what what should we actually do with this information? So we we have further evidence to support that. Well, your senators. Uh, well, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so we have more evidence to suggest that wealth and income impact uh, healthcare, and more evidence suggests that uh, as uh, clinicians, as healthcare providers we may not have as much impact as we think we do and that other determinants of health like income and wealth play a, a, a big role in how people do later on morbidity and mortality. Does that, does that sound like a, a reasonable summation of this article? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we certainly want doctors to keep being good doctors and keep delivering um, good medical care. I would say perhaps an implication on a day-to-day practice basis is that, you know, what that means is probably thinking outside of, you know, like I said, the pills and the tests and thinking, you know, what are the social circumstances that my patient is in and how should I be taking that into account? But also I think it is stepping outside of the clinic, outside of the hospital and entering the realm of, you know, policy and how do we as a society, you know, advance public health and health for the whole population. And, uh, you know, there was a really interesting and I found really inspirational um, piece of my mind uh, by Don Berwick uh, this week or last week where, you know, he's essentially making the argument that, you know, we as doctors and healthcare providers and health systems don't have the choice to be silent anymore because we just had the, the preponderance of evidence is too strong now that, you know, 
if we actually care about health of our patients, we can't just focus on medical care and we really have to care about the other things. And so kind of having an active voice in that I think is, is really important. Wonderful. How about uh, we'll end with a little bit more of a song. Uh, thanks for both of you for joining us today at this Jerry Pal podcast. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. Work hard all my lifetime. No help. Buy me a Mercedes Benz. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a color TV? Dialing for dollars is trying to find me. I wait for delivery each day until three. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a color TV? 